This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. Previously on Starship Sabres and Scoundrels. I'm playing the intro music. This is Star Wars. What's the issue? The issue? It's you're playing it way too fast. We've got things to do and a movie to discuss. Vader Claus flies all around the galaxy, delivering glorious dark gifts to all the dark boys and girls. So, how does he get in through the fireplace? Oh, I see. Ho, ho, ho. Harry Sipmus. Vader Claus! One foggy Christmas Eve, he used his lightsaber to guide Santa's sleigh. And when the children put his Sith robe on the snowman's shoulders, Frosty began to force choke all those around. He decks the halls with Sith holocrons and the ashes of his enemies. On the first day of Christmas, he gave his true love a Wookiee and Warshire tree. He actually enjoyed the Star Wars Holiday Special. You would be glad to leave without trying his figgy pudding. But what fun it is to ride with him in a one-ton-ton open sleigh. He is the most interesting Sith in the galaxy. I always drink, and sometimes when I'm desperate, I drink Dulce She's beer. Stay safe, my fools. And for episode eight, John Williams has begun recording music for the upcoming film. However, most of the scoring will occur later this spring. So they're giving him considerably more time than they gave Michael uh, Giacchino. I don't know, Dennis. Hmm. Okay. We've been focused on the developments of Rogue One all year, and so now this is our this is our big first movie discussion, yeah, uh, yeah. really, since uh, we started the show. Yeah. Um, and um, I wasn't disappointed, you know? Um, yeah, for me, um, I think you kind of addressed maybe the third act uh, of the film, which is, you know, the Battle of Scarif yeah. and uh, everything that's going on there. And I agree, that was the best act of the movie, um, in my opinion. In that act, I think the scene that was my favorite was the final scenes of the movie, which was Vader coming aboard the Rebel flagship and letting loose. Oh my gosh! On, on okay. those rebels. Okay, I'm gonna have and, to correct myself. <laughs> so. Yeah, um, <laughs> because I mean, you know, it, those rebels were desperately trying to get out of there. They just downloaded the plans, and everything everything goes dark. Yeah. Okay, here's some more instant fan reaction. What's your name, man, at ma'am, and uh, how many um, other lovers have you had besides your husband? <laughs> oh, uh, Mindy Reynolds, and I'm not going to answer that question, but the movie was really good. Okay, she's uh, clearly not going to be cooperative here. And sir, what's your name? Matt Reynolds. Okay, are you two related? I guess. Greetings, gentlemen. You know what time of year it is, and you were probably pondering just the perfect gift to show your female associate how much you respect her opinions and feelings. May I suggest you get the right gift that tells her things are perfect just as they are. A robe of the Jedi Order. These robes are just the thing to wear when you have group councils with her friends or if you just want to spend time with her in meditation on the Jedi Code. They are perfectly old-fashioned, and they come in all non-threatening colors. Brown, coffee, burnt sienna, toasted white bread, bantha pudu, dirt, rust, chestnut, and milk chocolate, and many, many more. She'll be expecting it and find the experience mutually beneficial. So, get her the perfect thing to send you farther into the friend zone this season and prove to her that you can be just like an old pair of slippers. She wouldn't have it any other way. Well, Taxus, you've been a very good boy this year. Wait, huh? Happy New Year, scoundrels. We're hoping that 2017 is off to a good start for you. Here's what we have coming up on episode 19. With Rogue One behind us, we turn to the upcoming Star Wars events of 2017. The next big event is Star Wars Celebration Orlando. We have some updates on Celebration in this week's news. Last week, the Star Wars community tragically lost royalty with the passing of everyone's beloved princess, Carrie Fisher. We celebrate the first general of the Resistance by sharing our favorite Leia Organa moments in this week's hypothetical. Also last week, we offered our in-depth review of Rogue One and asked for your feedback. Scoundrels, you responded in a huge way. We'll get to some of your emails and silence fools. 
We know everyone is still hurting a little and missing Carrie Fisher. Thanks for joining us to celebrate her life on this week's episode of Starships, Sabres, and Scoundrels. This doesn't sound like the type of music we agreed to. Oh. Mm, okay. Well, uh, let's try this. No, this is no better. Okay. Um, so, third time's a charm? In this case, it's not. Well, you told me to get depressing music. I told you to play celebratory music. Oh, um, I guess I got confused. How is that confusing? I get words with two E's mixed up. It's a special elephant I have. Two? Wait. Okay. It's special, all right. Wait a minute. Elephant? Oh, uh, I mean impediment. Uh, dang it, see? All right, well, we'll try again. All right, uh, how about this? better, but I think it needs a little something more. Okay. Hmm. Uh, how about this? This? This is good. May all acquaintances be forgotten. Scoundrels, welcome back to the Wake of Star Wars podcast. I'm your co-host and black armband of the Force, Darth Taxus, coming to you from the interfaith meditation room of my flagship, the Assessor Collector. And with me is the guy who's the life of any party, Dennis the Phantom Menace Keithley. Dennis? Happy New Year. You've been having a good holiday season, Taxus? Oh, yeah, the best. It's been awesome. You know, with my fabulous lifestyle. Yeah. New Year's just rang it in perfect. You know, bling, mm-hmm. hundos, making it rain, et cetera, et cetera. Playboy, you know, all that stuff. Yeah, that wild married lifestyle of yours. Oh. Yeah, well, good to hear. Um, yeah, it's been an interesting beginning 2017 so far. Hopefully this year will go a little bit better for everyone on the uh, beloved celebrity front. Um, but so anyway, we're... The focus of this episode, of course, is going to be uh, Carrie Fisher, yeah. and um, right, we're going to discuss her a bit more after we get past our news segment. Uh, but just off the top, thought it was important uh, to kind of set the bars to where we are. Uh, and first of all, uh, you and I are both blessed that we don't suffer from mental illness or addiction issues. And I know there are plenty of people out there that do, and in that respect, Carrie Fisher has been a champion for them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're both very glad that someone like her has been out there and been, right. a, been a spokesperson for that community. Um, so, you know, while we can appreciate that, that's not what she meant to us. You know, we are Star Wars fans and she has been uh, a princess and a general and a huge ambassador for Star Wars over the years. And, you know, that's how we came to know her and what we appreciate her for the most. Mm-hmm. But again, we acknowledge her for being much more than that. Mm-hmm. So, Again, uh, our discussion tonight will be focusing on that. Um, second, um, as you and I have just kind of gotten into the habit off air when talking about Carrie Fisher, we typically just call her Carrie. Um, yeah. And I think that is because she's been just such an invice, inviting personality uh, to her fans over the years. And it's easy to slip into calling her by her first name as opposed to Miss Fisher. So just wanted to put it out there that we mean no disrespect. Um, over the course of this episode, we're frequently going to be 
referring to her simply as Carrie uh, or Carrie Fisher. And if that sounds odd or disrespectful, we apologize in advance. And um, yeah, that, uh, that's it. But uh, so anyways, this episode tonight, uh, after we get through some news, is uh, intended to be a celebration of Carrie Fisher's life. Mm-hmm. Um, we think, uh, we know there's been a lot of podcasts that have been talking about her over the past week. And rightfully so. She was such a huge part of Star Wars. And uh, for many of us, the first princess we ever got to see on, t- uh, on, uh, on the movies. Uh, mm-hmm. So um, we hope that uh, this will be enjoyable for everyone. And at the end of the, uh, the, end of the show, you've had a chance to smile. Yes. Uh, after hearing our discussion. And, and a personal note. I have passed every single psychological evaluation people have made me take. Do you have the results in your hand? Not anymore. I figured. Well, let's get on to the news. Well, we're fresh off Rogue One, and now we've got some other news in the Star Wars galaxy. So with that, take it away, Texas. Thank you, Dennis. First up, Star Wars Celebration tickets. If you plan on acquiring an adult four-day badge to Celebration, you are hot out of luck. You'll need to look to the secondary market. Boom, boom. Just days after an email was sent to StarWars.com subscribers, it was announced that four-day Celebration tickets are sold out. As of this recording, single-day tickets are available for all four days of Celebration, and four-day children's tickets are still available. I guess you could pose as a child. If you're the right height, I suppose. Um, Yeah, so the good news is if you still want to go to Celebration all four days, you can do it. The bad news is it's going to be significantly more expensive. Um, In advance, a four-day ticket was, I believe, $150. Mm. Um, Now, if you want to buy individual tickets for all four days, you're looking at a combined total of $270. Uh, The Thursday, Friday, and Sunday tickets are $65 each, and the Saturday ticket is $75. Well, well, let me double-check your math. Okay. Did I do it? Did yeah. I get it right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, job. perfect. Now, should tickets be left and you decide you want to try and buy them on site, uh, the price is going to go up $10 per day. So, anyway, something to keep in mind, scoundrels, if you're going to head out to Rogue uh, or to Solo. Uh, getting to Rogue here. Celebration 1 The Rogue Orlando. Celebration 1 in Orlando, <laughs> right. If you want to head out to Celebration Orlando, and we hope to see you there, uh, you might want to get on tickets or figure out something soon. Yeah, uh, you know, I guess if you're like a baseball player uh, for the Little League from the Dominican Republic, you might be able to pass as a child. You know, speaking of tickets, did you see that our uh, friend Amy uh, Wishman uh, recently won tickets through, I think, some uh, through one of the charities that Steve Stanton no is way. promoting? Yeah, she did. Wow. I, I, believe she's, yeah, I believe she's taking her daughter now that she uh, got those tickets. So congratulations. Oh, that to her. is awesome. Yeah. That yeah was really congratulations, that. Amy. Congratulations. Of course, you probably used up all your luck just now. Just saying. Most definitely. Yeah. All right. In other words, celebration news, we got news on celebration badges. Dan Brooks at StarWars.com recently revealed that the badge art for the Star Wars Celebration Orlando badges is uh, exclusively been premiered on StarWars.com. Uh, Paul Shipper designed the art and created 18 different character portraits that will grace the attendees' badges this April in Orlando. Twelve of the badges were revealed in Brooks's column and include Ezra Bridger, Finn, Harrison Dula, Jen Erso, Kanan Jarrus, Kylo Ren, Luke Skywalker from The Force Awakens, Poe Dameron, Ray, Sabine Wren, Grand Admiral Thrawn, and Zeb. So, Taxus, did you get a chance to check those out? Yeah, they look pretty sweet. Aren't they kind of like that, uh... It's not black and white, but what's that terminology? Uh, they look like they're hand drawn, like a beige uh, kind of, you know. Yeah, it, maybe a, a pencil on, you know, parchment paper or something. But uh, I'm not I, I read artist. a bit of the column, and it looks like he did those on the computer. But but they're still really cool. They're really good. Did you have uh, one that was your favorite? Uh, I thought the Ray looked great. I mean, I really like that, and Jyn Erso. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know how. Or if there is any logic and how they assign you which badge you get. Um, and I was trying to decide which one I would want if I got to choose. And quite honestly, I couldn't decide. Yeah. Um, they were all really cool. I, uh, I think it just depends on what you purchase. Like um, a four day pass last year had or the last time had Han Solo on it. Um, mm-hmm. And then if you had media credentials, you got the um, Inquisitor. That was really cool. 
you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, they've got, there's six uh, badges that they haven't shown yet on StarWars.com, at least not at the time of this recording. Uh, but, you know, 18 different portraits. So I'm assuming there's probably going to be multiple portraits for different, uh, you know, probably one for a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or, um, you know, or Thursday, uh, individual day ticket, one for maybe four day. I'm assuming VIP gets its own, but there's an awful lot of badges, uh, just to do on, you know, based on classifications. So there so, should, uh, there could be at least 11 different ones, because if you're thinking about like single day adult, single day child, um, that's true, there, yeah. there's eight there. Then you've got and the two three, four day, the two different for child and adult and then media pass. And there could be different media levels like media versus press. If you right. know what I'm saying. VIP badge. Oh, uh, the VIP badges. Yeah. I wonder if that's in there too. Yeah. Well, at any rate, you know, they, they're all very cool that he did. Uh, Shepard did an excellent, uh, excellent job with all those. And I'd be happy to have any of them. Um, mm -hmm. They look, uh, they look outstanding. Yeah, they look really good. Nice little, they're nice little mementos in and of themselves, you know. So. Certainly. Um, all right. Next up, we've got some news on Star Wars Celebration host. In other Star Wars Celebration Orlando news, the stage hosts were re recently announced. I think this is neat. Warwick Davis, Wicket himself, will host the main stage, and the always gregarious and wonderful personality of David Collins and voice officially in Star Wars uh, movies, right? Multiple now, right? Right. Uh, is reprising his role as host of the digital stage. And last but not least, Amy Ratcliffe resumes her role as host of the behind-the-scenes stage. So, yeah, yeah, that's pretty nice. Uh, I got to see David when he was doing the... I think he was uh, hosting the Kevin Kiner discussion. And Monty and I were able to check that out last time. Um, yeah. And, yeah, he the crowd eats him up. He knows how to handle <laughs> Right. These are the same hosts for this, basically the same jobs that they had at Celebration Europe uh, yeah. this past summer. And that's great. Um, you know, I mainly saw uh, Warwick Davis uh, from the main stage on the um, live stream that they mm -hmm. had through Verizon. And he did a great job. Um, I'd like to see, I hope James Arnold Taylor uh, gets a job somewhere in this oh, or he yeah. at least appears yeah. panels because i enjoyed watching him at star wars celebration anaheim and maybe that's just where they'll use him again or i don't know maybe he was busy but uh at least i hope he's involved somehow at celebration uh but amy radcliffe is also you know fantastic i've enjoyed hearing her on full sith all these uh years and you know she just recently stepped down from a full-time host there and obviously she's got other important things <laughs> to do i suppose uh, so you know, yeah. Right, you know, writing for StarWars.com and the Nerdist and now this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so she'll be busy. But, you know, great great hosts, uh, good yeah. selections there. Okay, well, uh, just kind of rounding up some other Celebration news. Uh, you know, the first official guest for Celebration has been announced, and it'd be none other than Doug Shang, who is the Lucasfilm Vice President and Executive Creative, Dir Creative Director. Uh, I, I, have have his, I have his action figure now. Do you really? Yeah, okay. I, I really would love to get it signed. Is he, like sitting over a, uh, you know, artist desk sketching stuff. Yes. Uh, yes. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, the, pencil, the pencil looked a little weird, you know, mm -hmm. it was a little bent in the middle, but I get over it. Right. Well, Mitt, you know, box. Sure. His work was, uh, of course, featured during the prequels. And, uh, then again, uh, appeared some in, uh, the force awakens and now rogue one. And in of the, uh, last bit of celebration news that we've got is that, uh, the tattoo pavilion will be back, which has kind of become a staple of the past couple celebrations. Mm -hmm. Uh, the tattoo artists haven't been announced. Uh, so keep an eye on star Wars celebration.com for the announcements of those. And it looks like if you want to get a star Wars tattoo, uh, once they announce who those artists are going to be, you'll need to go, to their websites to uh, book your appointment. And I can guarantee uh, they'll probably be 100% hepatitis free. 100% probable? Sure. Um, I'm not a tattoo guy myself. I appreciate a good tattoo on others. So uh, if you want to do that, then by all means, uh, keep an eye on that. I collect tattoos. Moving on. All right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, it is less than 100 days to celebration. Indeed. Wow. Yeah, it's coming up wait. fast. But more recent news. We've got Rogue One box office re results, Dennis. Uh, Rogue One continues to do very well at the box office. After two weeks, it has cleared 350 as of today uh, domestically. And if you consider the international box office, the total take is $653 million. 
So, uh, yeah, that's pretty good. The, you know, it's not quite Force Awakens numbers right now, but, you know. Uh, well, nothing was going to be the Force Awakens numbers. Uh, you know, I, I'm i interested to see what Episode Eight's going to do. Um, I think it'll do better than Rogue One uh, because people so got into Ray, Finn, and Poe. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the thing, the advantage that the Force Awakens had was pent-up demand. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 10 years between movies. And now we had to wait in one year, uh, you know, from our last Star Wars movie to this one. So, you know, the, that uh, that excitement just wasn't quite matched. And, you know, there was uh, I didn't experience a lot of it myself, um, but there was some confusion as to what this movie was supposed to be. Um, you know, the diehard fans didn't necessarily know where this fell in some cases. I do have a funny story about that. Um, <laughs> after. um I, I don't know. I, I saw the movie a few times. I've seen it four times now. I've been taking various family members and friends to see it. Uh, but I was uh, celebrating Christmas with uh, my mother-in-law, and I got a text from one of my cousins that uh, started off rather ominously asking me to settle a dispute. <laughs> and I was like, what fresh family <laughs> drama is this? Only to find out she wanted to know exactly when Rogue One was supposed to occur. So I laughed about that for a few minutes and answered her question. Uh, she had a debate going with her uh, her parents and my aunt and uncle. So anyways, that was fun. But uh, so, yeah, this is great. Rogue One's been successful. I suspect this will be impacting the direction of future Star Wars projects after the sequel trilogy is complete. Um, and we'll see what the future holds. Yeah, because uh, I'm not sure how much they put into it, but it seems like this would be enough of a success to keep doing one off projects like this. Yeah. Yeah. Other standalone stories. Uh, you know, we've got Han Solo coming up. Uh, it was confirmed recently that the other standalone movie that, uh, uh, what's his face that did Fantastic Four, uh, Trank, yeah, uh, was uh, was doing was in fact a Boba Fett movie, um, but you know once that fell apart uh, and he was dismissed from the project slash he left it. Um, you know the story is a little unclear. Yeah, uh, you know th- what that standalone movie is going to be now is I think up in the air, but there will be another one coming. Uh, after episode nine, See, I would so, so I would so dig a Boba Fett standalone. I mean, you, yeah, you just do I so suppose. Much that. I hope it's not an origin story because we know what that is. Uh, I'd like to see a movie featuring Boba Fett, maybe not having him as the central character, but yeah. that's. I'd a like to see him growing up in school because, like his dad, he was ahead of the class. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll do it for this episode's news. <laughs> Sixteen has been a rough year for celebrity deaths. This year, we lost Prince, David Bowie, Alan Rickman, Glenn Frey, Gary Shandling, Gordy Howe, Anton Yelchin, and Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, to name but a few. In the Star Wars galaxy, we already lost Kenny Baker, R2-D2 himself. However, none of that prepared Star Wars fan for what happened last week. After experiencing a cardiac event aboard a plane on a way home to, from London to Los Angeles, Carrie Fisher passed away just days later. Since Carrie's passing, expressions of mourning, grief, and condolences have poured in from all corners of the Star Wars community. Of course, she meant so much to everyone as the princess from the galaxy far, far away, and even more as General Organa of the Resistance. However, she mattered even more as a champion of those overcoming addiction and those living and functioning with mental illness. After considering the best way to honor Carrie Fisher, we here at Starship Sabres and Scoundrels decided to celebrate her life. Uh, Due to that, we've decided to discuss our favorite Princess Leia and General Organa moments from the Star Wars movies. So, taxes. You know, again, we just kind of thought about this, and there's been some time to grieve, and we know everyone is shaken up by this, and it's really hard to comprehend. But, you know, we decided, you know, we're here to entertain. We've always had fun. You know, having fun. Um, That's right. It's for, fun to have like fun. Description. That's right. So, you know, what better way to celebrate her yeah, than to kind of just you know recount some of our favorite mo- uh, Princess Leia moments from the film when Carrie Fisher was at her best. Yeah. So, you know, with that, what do you, you know what do you have first for us? Uh, well, you know, her character is so I think essential to the storyline because her wit, her witticisms you know her her little comebacks um 
she she holds her own so many in so many scenes against the men you know what i mean right. um and even with uh you know i love when han's like um you know well if we can just avoid any more female advice maybe we'll get out of here you know and she's like just looking at him like oh you're so gonna get it you know it looks good kill yeah and luke's even like yeah i hear you man <laughs> you know what i mean and right. uh but yeah she's like listen you know um i don't know where you are blah 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 but from now on you take orders from me you know or something or you do as i say it's like i only take orders from one person me it's a wonder you're still alive you know and then she's exactly. got that, that moment uh you know somebody get this walking carpet out of my way <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. and, I, and i just love that because she was tough like that but she would um counterpoint it with moments of tenderness um like for example you know, uh, I, I remember never really thinking about this, but then Star Wars Oxygen uh, revealed uh, the music after Obi-Wan dies. It's not the main Star Wars theme. It's not the Luke Skywalker theme. It's Princess Leia's theme, you know? Yes. Which is which is kind of odd. You know, I guess maybe they just did it because it fit better there. It was more dramatic. But, um, but then afterwards, when they're on the ship, you know, Luke's like, I just can't believe this guy i met 30 minutes ago is gone and uh she's like oh it'll be okay you know i mean and she's trying to console him you know what i mean she's not she, she's not like yeah well i just lost two billion people on my planet so you know grow up farm boy <laughs> you know what i mean right uh right. It, it was she, she, it's just a very unique character that that will never be duplicated and she was perfect for it and i think that's part of what made the initial movie such a such a hit exactly yeah you hit on several moments there and uh, you and i both had an opportunity to contribute to retro zaps uh Terry fisher in memoriam post that was published a few days ago and i highly recommend uh scoundrels check that one out yeah uh, one of the things that i noted in my contribution to that post was uh, star wars is the first film i ever saw uh you know at the ripe old age of three back in 1977 wow. um and you know so Carrie Fisher was my first on-screen princess. And what I've come to appreciate later uh, in life was that she wasn't a damsel in distress. The first time we see her, what is she doing? She's shooting stormtroopers that are trying to capture her. And they subdue her by stunning her. They don't pick her up and throw over her shoulder and take her you know, oh, mercy me, help me. Yeah, kicking uh, away. and screaming. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, she, you know, she, she puts up a fight. And <laughs> Uh, you know, so you know, she only had to be rescued because she was outnumbered and outgunned, not because she was helpless. Uh, so that that's my first moment is that uh, you know she uh, you know she was tough. She gave as good as she got, yes, she did. Uh, which you know I think was how Carrie Fisher lived her life. Uh, you know she didn't let anyone uh, boss her around. Uh, you know she she stood up for herself, and I appreciated that very much. Mm-hmm. You know, and I always thought. <sighs> The cost, okay, initially, I I feel like Star Wars, the the original A New Hope, it starts out kind of like mysterious. You know, here's all this mystery going on. Who is that? What's she doing to that little robot? What's what's happening? She's wearing robes. Who wears robes in space? You know? Um, And she even kind of reveals herself a little bit by pulling back the robe, you know, almost like, you know, just giving a hint, you know, to the, to the, to the viewers. And, and then fast forward to, uh, tattooing, which to me felt very mysterious. It's still, even the music feels different to me. You know what I mean? It's very, very kind of, what's behind the rock, you know, kind of stuff. Not, not cold and harsh, like the Imperial, you know, um, and Luke stumbles across the message right um and we just get that little blip that just repeats over and over again and that's just enough to get luke wondering mm, what is that what's going on you know exactly so she's the herald or the messenger yeah and the campbell's traditional you know hero's journey uh she's the one that presents you know the the cry for help and right. you know it goes something like this and i remember mm-hmm. thinking well, what is that? What is that she's repeating? It's very odd. It's very, I, I don't know. It just really built, built the tension for me, you know? Mm. And finally, that tension's released when um, Obi-Wan saves them. 
And Luke's like, I think there was a message for you, you know? And, I seem uh, to have found it. Yeah, yeah. And and that message is like, I mean, it's very, uh, it's very, it, it's not, I don't want to say iconic, but what, what would you say, Dennis? Like that, that whole speech she gives. I saw part of the message. He w- I seem to have found it. General Kenobi, years ago you served my father in the Clone Wars. Now he begs you to help him in his struggle against the Empire. I regret that I am unable to present my father's request to you in person, but my ship has fallen under attack, and I'm afraid my mission to bring you to Alderaan has failed. I have placed information vital to the survival of the Rebellion into the memory systems of this R2 unit. My father will know how to retrieve it. You must see this droid safely delivered to him on Alderaan. This is our most desperate hour. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. It's like, she's well, it's, you know, it's another version of kind of, uh, you know, I want to say the prologue, but it, it outlines everything that they need to do uh, and what this mission is upcoming is about, which is, you know, there's a battle station that's being built, you know, long ago, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you served us in the Clone Wars, and you can share this message with them, uh, this gun was here in a second, I'm not that they don't already know it, but it, it's a, it sets up the movie and it is a, you know, your only hope. And it kind of like what I was saying earlier, she wasn't a damsel in distress, but she needed allies. And this was her call for allies. This was her call for assistance in the ongoing, in the ongoing battle, in the ongoing war. Right. And then, you know, we just get these little mentions of the Clone Wars. And Leia's like talking like, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, I took Clone Wars history in the seventh grade on Alderaan. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you know, her adoptive father lived it. He knew all about it. Right, so. right. Years ago, you served my father during the clo- I, And It's almost like, right, it's it's firsthand knowledge. I mean, I just, again, it's like all these little things that really suck you into it. I mean, she's so part of that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Well, moving on from there, I also appreciated In a New Hope, her confrontation with the villains. Uh, oh, which yeah. is you know, again, back on the ten to four, she gets marched up to Darth Vader, and you know, she looks, you know, Darth Vader. Only you could be so bold. <laughs> and, you, know, <laughs> like, what, you know, what do you think you're doing, Mister, uh, on my ship? How dare you come here? And right. you know, of course, he's looking at her like, you know, oh, don't you know, don't be so, you know, act so surprised, Your Highness. You know, she was quite an actress. She was buying time for the rebellion as they were trying to make it away, you know, get a make get away with these plans. And then later, um, you know, when she's brought to the bridge of the Death Star right before the destruction of Alderaan. Right. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, Governor, you know Tarkin, Governor Tarkin. I thought Tarkin. I recognized your <laughs> smell, your foul stench the moment I came on board. I, I love that line. Oh, and, yeah. And Terry did such an excellent job delivering it. And, you know, and then even later in that movie, when Han and Luke come to rescue her, uh, you know, she takes the rescue into her own hands. Uh, you know, right. They get her. All she needed was someone to open the cell door, and what she did, and she got a blaster in her hands. You know, she blasted her away into the um, into the garbage chute, and they got down there. No, come. <laughs> Granted, they need a little help from uh, R two and C three PO to get out of there. But you know, into the garbage chute, <laughs> fly boy. Into the garbage chute, <laughs> fly by. It's like you know, you got in here, but you didn't have a plan for getting us out. Some escape. You know, yeah, I know. He's the brains. That's so great. Right. Such a such a take charge woman. I loved it. I mean, the dialogue's uh, wonderful, but it's just that her delivery is so wonderful. I mean, you know, like when whenever Tarkin says, "Oh, Dantooine's far too remote," you know, but uh, we'll test it here, and she's like, "What?" You know, um, man. I mean, it's just real powerful. You know, her delivery, mm-hmm. and I think we just kind of overlook that stuff. Uh, I mean, you know, we t- kind of take it for granted, you know. Right, right. Well, you know, moving on to The Empire Strikes Back, okay. uh, which is the next uh, film, obviously. So, we get to encounter her in that movie. Han makes a point of, you know, letting uh, General uh, Reichen, is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Know that he's got to go because he's got a bounty on mm-hmm. his head and he's got to get some debts paid off. And he makes sure that Leia is within earshot. And, you know, throws a glance her way. And, you know, uh, he walks up to her and is like, well, you know, I guess this is a long princess. And she's just kind of like, you know, rolls like, yeah, I guess that's right. I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> I got a job to do in case you didn't know I'm running an alliance. Um, and, and he's so, all like, look at me, please. <laughs> right. And even though she chases him down in the hallway, it is a 
obviously there was an affection between Han and Leia even back then. Yeah. You know, it, it didn't it didn't take long to pick up on that. You know, after they got out of the Death Star uh, and a New Hope, but there was also a strong element of you are an asset to this rebellion and. You know, you're trying to make me jealous. You're trying to make me chase you. You're trying to make me acknowledge feelings. And she just wasn't willing to do that. She had a job. She was trying to maintain a balance uh, between her responsibilities to the rebellion and her personal life. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, and, you know, I love the line she gives Han, which is, you know, you know, he tells her, you know, you don't want me to leave because of the way you feel about me. And she says, well, you know, yes, you're a great asset. You know, we could use you. And then he says, nope, that's not it. And, uh, you know, uh-huh. he makes him uh-huh. yeah, uh-huh. you know, I'd rather kiss a Wookiee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he says, you know, I could arrange that. And he could use a good kiss. So, <laughs> you know, and I guess that brings up a point. It's hard sometimes to talk about Leia without talking about Han. Um, and that's not to say she's dependent on him to be a good character because she was great in her own right. But uh, the two had such great chemistry. See, I um, think I think that Han would not have been Han like we all know and love him without her. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, I mean, even through all three movies, you know, he's he, just their interactions. That's the most memorable stuff. I mean, let, let's face it, the by and large empire was fairly actionless you know what i mean well i mean we got the I huge battle say, of hoth i mean i'm just saying in between cloud city and hoth yes it maybe had its down moments as far as action was concerned but those moments were filled with chemistry and tension exactly yes and, and those that's why i love empire strikes back to this day you know mm-hmm. because it captures yeah you can see their love hate relationship building you know and especially in the close proximities um you know that they had with falcon for so long Um, speaking of which i saw this on twitter yesterday and i wish i could remember who it was so i could credit them but they showed a page from the script of the empire strikes back when Han and Leia are on the on the um, cockpit of the Falcon, right. as they're getting ready to float away from the uh, Star Destroyer, as they float away with the garbage, and they showed all of Carrie's notes and how much she influenced the dialogue in that scene. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, and you know, even, you know, she's been she's renowned as being a script doctor in Hollywood, and. It goes way back, even, you know, I don't, maybe even before The Empire Strikes Back, but this is the first instance that I'm aware of her doing it. But, you know, the whole exchange of, you know, you know, you know, the Lando system, no, Lando's not a man, you know, you know, in that system, he's a man. And, uh, you know, you know, he's a smuggler, a scoundrel, you'd like him. And she responds, thanks. Uh, you know, those type of things. She doctored the script. Oh, cool. And, and helped establish some of the chemistry and just some of the natural give and take of those characters, uh, which just kind of goes to some of Carrie's talents. You know, the other thing I like about her appearance in The Empire Strikes Back, um, you know, it, she starts off the movie. She's a rebel leader. We just discussed her interaction with Han. And then when the Imperials are invading Hoth, who are all the rebel pilots standing around listening to? Right. Her. They're yeah. listening to her. She's the one that's outlining the mission. She's the one that's telling them what it is they have to do and how they're going to do it. And when a rebel pilot objects, you know, two X-Wings against a Star Destroyer, you know, she comes right back. You know, she knows it sounds like a hopeless mission, but hey, we've got the ion cannon. We're going to fire some shots. We're going to give you guys some cover. You know, we can do this. Uh, we're rebels. And she, just her presence, you know, gives them hope, gives them an opportunity, gives them a fighting chance in the face of what would appear to be hopeless odds. Yeah, wasn't that ho- Hobby Killivan that said that? Yes, yeah, no, I think so. You know, yeah. I mean, she could have grabbed his ear. Come here, come here. Um, but no, she hush didn't. you, right? Yeah, yeah. Be, silence. Um, and don't tell the other kids how hard this is. Uh, it's- <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh gosh, there's always one in the crowd. Um, the uh, you know, and I, I do like that because that's another part of the progression. It's and again, it's not like a subservient kind of thing. I don't mean that at all. It's just we start to see through the movie. We we see her her strength, but through the movie they really emphasized her femininity, in my opinion. You know, right. again, it's but like the tender know. moments, especially like when she's with, just like you're saying the the detachment scene. You know, she's like, you have your moments, you know, and uh, 
not many of them or something like that and you know gives them a little kiss you know right yeah not many of them but you do have them right well and, and some of the other banter that she has with han i mean you see it so much of the time now in the star wars comics the uh the banter that han and leia have mm-hmm. and there's always the obligatory scene that comes right out of the empire strikes back with han solo kind of you know because he's so much taller than her and he's leaning forward kind of most over most over her yeah. and he's either pointing to her or pointing a thumb back at himself and you know you pick up any star wars comic and you're almost guaranteed to find this panel somewhere in it but this movie you know, empire strikes back established that han and Leia banter and you know some of the lines of you know, you know we have no time to discuss this in a committee you know i'm not a committee yeah. and, <laughs> you know would it help if i got out and push yeah it might, might. <laughs> uh, you know you, you always said you wanted to be around when i failed well this is you know, this is a chance i take it back you know there's so much of that classic dialogue that you know from those two characters that came from the impression it wasn't you know it was a little bit there in a new hope and a little bit there in return of the jedi but it was born out of the empire strike yeah, back. yeah, I think you're uh, right. Right, and she, you know, she gave as good as she got. You know, we said, same was the New Hope. You know, she, you know, she didn't take it from anybody. Right. Uh, she, you know, she gave it back. Um, you know, which kind of leans into, uh, you know, back on when they get to Cloud City. Yeah, yeah. I was their guests to say. there. It, you know, it took them forever. They limped into Cloud City, and their mm-hmm. guests there, and they're just waiting for the ship to repair. You know, they've lost C three PO, and she doesn't have a lot to do. But when push comes to shove and Han is getting frozen in carbonite, mm-hmm. Chewbacca is starting to lose it. And, you know, Han tries to soothe Chewbacca by saying, you have to take care of the princess. But in reality, it was Leia who had to get Chewbacca under control. And as soon as Han says that, you know, she leans over to Chewbacca and kind of grabs him by yeah. the arm and gets him soothed down because she, you know, in, in the same instance that Han was entrusting Leia's care to Chewbacca. Chewbacca's care was being entrusted to Leia. Yeah, yeah, and that's that. And picked, that's that tender moment. Yeah, you know what you mean. Mm-hmm. And then she follows it up not long after that. As soon as Lando can summon some of his uh, guards on Cloud City to get you know to you know, to rustle up those stormtroopers and get them escorted to the side quietly, and they get blasters. Leia takes charge. Yeah, uh, for trying to rescue yeah. Han from Boba Fett. You know what? Always kind of. What part of that whole scene with Chewie going, you know, uh, bonkers? I loved how um, Leia was just like staring at Vader, you know, uh-huh. and um, and then she goes over to Chewie. It's very different than the whole Leia Vader, A New Hope. You know, she she's right. not cracking, you know. Little smart well, she's part comments. of the group now. You know, the, the, these are not just her rescuers. This is family, right? Uh, and, but but know, that look is back. like that look was one of like I don't know. I, you know, it's like fear. You know what I mean? It's like fear incarnate. You know, or or she's just realizing if if I don't calm Chewie down, he's a dead Wookie. You know, or something. Yeah. I mean, there's just something there that I wish I kind of had a little more insight to what that why they included that scene you know Mm -hmm. well speaking of fear obviously bravery is looking fear in the face and still doing what's necessary Uh, and we get that in Return of the Jedi Uh, when Luke and Lando and uh, Leia devise a plan for rescuing Han Solo they discover that he's at Jabba's palace and her part of the plan is infiltrating as Boosh the bounty hunter yeah so, you know, I remember as a kid watching this bounty hunter wander around with Chewbacca, and I was sold. I mean, I didn't realize that was Leia at the time, uh, you know, but she just, you know, she walked in and she owned the place. Uh, when the gambling, you know, the uh, bargaining got rough, she pulls out a detonator. Uh, yeah, again, yeah. she doesn't uh, stand down to anybody. Uh, she, you know, she does what needs to be done. Yeah. And, uh, Actually, that was one of my favorite action figures as a kid. <laughs> but yeah, um, but and after I, a time, I think that was the only Leia figure I may have had after I yeah. lost the universe. <laughs> oh, I had, I had all of them. I had the A New Hope. I had the Cloud City. I, I never had the uh, Empire Strikes Back uh, one, but I loved that costume, um, the like jumpsuit thing she was wearing the whole time. Um, but yeah, it it kind of made you wonder what the, I mean. 
at least I always wondered, and I'm trying to remember, Dennis, did they address this, the backstory with her getting that costume? What, the... Yeah. The, the Bausch? Well, Was not that? in a canon source, in okay. the uh, Shadows of the Empire. That's it. She picks it up from, um, as she's getting ready to invade uh, Prince Caesar's palace. Yeah, and I always wondered, like, wow, well, where'd she get that? What is... Uh, did she learn that language? I mean, what is that? You know well, I mean? it's, you know, further legends explanation has it. You know, I believe that the race is the Ubis, Ubis. Um, and, you know, they were a warrior race from another planet. And uh, they showed up in some of the uh, Knights of the Old Republic games yeah. as well. Uh, but, yeah, you know, it was, you know, there was a the brain from Star Trek closely resembled uh, them mm. as well. So it's kind of an homage. Uh, right. But it was very iconic, uh, yeah. that look and that costume. And plus, very again, she's very mysterious. You know what I mean? Uh, you <laughs> got a little bit of a reveal there. Um, and I just... Man, I mean, it, it just made that whole uh, that whole opener for me. Just that little like, well, what is that? What are they doing? You know, I mean, now we take it for granted again because we know who it is. You know, exactly. But back then, uh, you know, didn't know. Well, I mean, she's not pulling a Lando and like lifting up the helmet just a little, see a little bit of her face. You know, exactly. Well, it's much easier for him to get in the palace than her. Right. But you know, but you know, this scene's not is followed up not too long after that. Yeah, uh, when. You know, Luke arrives, and then he has to fight the Rancor, and eventually they all up on um, the skiff at the Sarlacc pit. Mm-hmm. And you know, she's in the iconic gold bikini, and her part of the battle at the Sarlacc pit is, is when she becomes the Hut Slayer, and yeah. she just kills Jabba the Hut by strangling him with the chains, which you know, the symbol of her own oppression. Uh, you know, another iconic, an iconic costume, an iconic mm-hmm. scene. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you know, that is become one of the iconic, if not the most iconic looks, maybe unfortunately uh, for Leia. Um, because again, you know, it, in, a, in some sense it objectifies her. Mm-hmm. But uh, in the other sense, again, you know, that, that scene where, you know, she was forced to wear a costume that it was demeaning, uh, especially for someone of her station. She was royalty. She was a senator. She was the right. leader of the rebellion. And then she was treated no better than a common slave girl. But she took those chains and she defeated the one that would oppress her with them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another great Leia moment. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's just, I mean, hey, that's what a hut would do, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. Um, but I especially am dismayed because of all the uh, guys that decide to wear them. Uh, I don't even want to go into that. Yeah, man. <sighs> Boy. I mean, it's like watching a slow train wreck. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> well, in the one sense, I can't, appre- I, I can't appreciate that they may be trying to make a statement uh, about yeah, objectification. Well, it's but, been made. Right. <laughs> Stop wearing it. <laughs> anyway. right. um, especially if you look like Jabba. Um, let's see. Um... Yeah, I, you know, even her kind of, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, you know, the rebel outfit, you know, I, I thought it, she just, uh, or those scenes like, you know, with the rebel alliance gathering and everything. I mean, she's just so, um, she's back to being her, the, the rebel leader in this one, you know? Um, yeah. And, you know, what's great about that is, is that she's not above getting her hands dirty. Right. Uh, you know, Han surprises her. Because he's always been on the lookout for himself. You know, he, he reluctantly joined the rebellion. And we've seen recently in the Han Solo comic that he's having a crisis of identity, which is he's always been, it's always been easy for him not to get involved mm-hmm. because then he has to lend his loyalty to something else other than himself, which he knows he's prone to do. And once he goes in, once you earn his loyalty, then he, <laughs> you've got it. I mean, he'll, right. he'll do anything for you. And so he was so resistant to get involved in the rebellion. And, you know, Leia and Luke and Lando and the droids rescue him from Java, And they get there, you know, they arrive on uh, home one for the meeting about the Death Star. And he volunteers to lead the strike force onto Endor. And, you know, completely surprises her because, you know, as far as she's concerned, this is out of character. But once she does, you know, that shocked look that he gives him, you know, such an incredible piece of acting. I think it's it's underrated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, that just, she leans away. She's just absolutely stunned and she <laughs> completely sells it. And then the next moment is, you know, she's overjoyed, uh, you know, that, you know, this person that she's come to admire and love, you know, did something 
that you know she's Selfless. thrilled. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know that that's that, you know that was beyond her expectations. She loved that, and so she jumps right in. You know that yeah. you know I'm with you, and she goes. And boy, does she prove to be an asset on that mission. Because mm-hmm. uh, you know they get to indoor, and when they're trying to sneak up on the scout troopers, <laughs> and steps on the twig, and so you know that sets up that motion. You know she charges right up to the yep. speeder bike, jumps on it, and chases after them. Doesn't waste a moment. You yeah. know, did quick, she lay one out action. too? Oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like she starts blasting one trying to get away. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, and of course, Luke's like, oh, wait, you know, trying to chase after her, you know, the Jedi. <laughs> right. Um, and then, you know, her, uh, the separation with them, you know, that was a critical point because she's, uh, she's the one that brings then the Ewoks into the fray, of course. And, right. uh, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, diplomatic skills were employed from her uh, not becoming. Uh, their sacrifice like Han was about to be <laughs> right know? and well uh, one more moment for Return of the Jedi and then we can need to get, get on to the Force yeah, Awakens because sure. we're going to run short on this segment but you know she had an opportunity to flip the script on Han uh, because it, in the Empire Strikes Back she was confronted with the moment that she might lose Han and so she admits that she loves him and when yeah. he gives the I kind of long I, I know and then after she kind of gets shot in the shoulder at the bunker on indoor you know and just as they're getting ready uh, to be kind of overrun by the troopers she reveals that she's got that holdout blaster and so Han you know flips the script I love you and then she gets to give that very sly I know before yeah. he shoots the trooper you know, perfect. Uh, great script writing. Uh, another great Princess Leia moment. Well, and if I could just throw one last one in there real quick. I think the whole <laughs> Leia-Luke exchange in the Ewok village um, is one of the best moments out of the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he's, he's revealing to her exactly who she is. And she takes it, you know, very well. <laughs> <laughs> discovering that you're the daughter of the dark lord of uh, a dark lord of the sith you know um but um she she tells but but she has a moment of weakness in this you know right she tells luke you, you've got to run you've got to run away from him yeah yeah well again he's family now right and the last right. thing she wants to do is have is sacrifice him to the empire sacrifice him to the, she's already lost a lot to the empire by that point she lost her home world she lost her mm-hmm. adoptive family she has no idea who her birth mother and father are at that yeah, point yeah and the last thing she wants to do is lose luke on a personal level and as an asset to the rebellion yep. and so you know she's looking out for a friend at that point so yeah. and you know found a newfound brother mm-hmm. but um, okay so let's finish up here with the force awakens okay. and there obviously aren't as many leia moments in that movie uh you know we have her arrival on tagodano that's her introduction um it wouldn't have been if some of the deleted scenes had made it into the movie yeah. uh she gets to verbally spar with han about how useful he was on the death star <laughs> <laughs> on dakar and then i think perhaps the two most touching moments from that movie are when she realizes that kylo was killed han yeah and then uh, when the um, resistance forces return to Dakar from uh, Starkiller base and she meets Ray for the first time and yeah. they give each other that consoling hug. You know, she's obviously lost a, an estranged husband and the father of her son. And Ray has lost a new mentor that she looked on as a father. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation before the release of that movie uh, that Ray might be Han and Leia's daughter. Uh, there still is the possibility that there's some sort of familial relationship there. Uh, yeah. but, but it was a very touching. And then, of course, at the end of that movie, you know, she gets to wish Ray, you know, may the force be with you as right. Ray sets off to find Luke. Yeah. And passes on kind of the, the torch, so to speak, in the Falcon and mm-hmm. the Chewie, you know. Um, yeah. I, you know, okay, when, when, I saw her. I was very happy for this. You know, mm-hmm. um, I felt like she didn't really have as big of a role as possibly she would in. I'm, you know, and this is kind of hard to say in in one of the uh, sequels. You know, um, like episode eight or nine. You know, um, what what were they? <laughs> Let's face it. I mean, the the Senate's been wiped out, right? So, right. what kind of a role was she going to? And and I don't know how much more of what they've done. I mean, right now it's just complete speculation, 
you know, uh, on my part. And I know they'll probably do something great with it, something, you know, wonderful. But I was really looking forward to seeing more of her in the next couple of movies. Right. Well, we know that her parts for episode eight are already complete. So we'll get to get to see, you know, Princess or General Organa at that point, you know, and, and that. Um, and I hope they come up with a graceful exit for the character from the series of yeah. this. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's too early. And really, I mean, you know, let's just deal with what we've got right now. Yeah, and right, at some right. point, we You're can right. figure out what to do about with her in episode nine if they want to try and digitally recreate her like they did Tarkin in Rogue yeah. One. I'm, I'm uh, just saying like that, that I, I, I really thought, I mean, it, it was great what she did in seven. Sure. But I was really looking forward to more of Leia. And Me too. Especially with Luke. I, I, and I'm sure we'll probably get that, you know, like I want to well, see that's... her reunion with Luke. Well, that's what everyone yeah. wanted. I think everyone, that's the one thing I think a lot of people wanted from The Force Awakens that we didn't get, which was to see Luke, Han, and Leia, the big three, all together one last time. Aww. And we didn't get that. Now, you know, uh, and we're not going to get an episode eight uh, yeah. because Han's gone. And, you know, now we have a limited opportunities for Luke and Leia. So, unless he's uh, haunting the Falcon. Well, uh, right. We've already <laughs> been over that. Okay. Well, you know, I think. One of the things I realized from this discussion is that, you know, Carrie Fisher's Princess Leia really came in and owned every scene that she was a part of oh, in yeah. Star Wars. Uh, so she'll definitely be missed. Um, but, you know, we also, you know, put the word out that we're looking for uh, any of our listeners to, if they had any thoughts about, you know, Carrie Fisher and Princess Leia that they wanted to share. And uh, we received an email from our past guest, fellow retro zapper, Courtney Martin, Martin, who uh, had this to say. She says, uh, Hi guys, my favorite Carrie moment was when I was lucky enough to meet her a few years back at Indie PopCon. The first thing I did when I got there was buy my ticket to get my photo with Carrie. I was nervous and excited as I waited in line. I couldn't believe she came to Indiana and I had the chance to meet her. People were herded through pretty quickly due to very long lines, so I didn't really get to talk to her. I dressed in cosplay as Indoor Leia, camouflage poncho, etc. that day. One cool thing I do recall is that Carrie did a double take when she saw my outfit. I always cherish that memory. She was so nice and genuinely loved her fans. She threw her arm around my neck and pulled me in for a close picture. I was so shocked I looked goofy in the photo, but I don't care. I got to meet one of my heroes. <laughs> so that was from Courtney. And, you know, I'm very envious of that experience. Yeah. Uh, I didn't ever get the chance to meet uh, Carrie Fisher. So thanks, Courtney, for sharing that. I love hearing about moments like that with, um, you know, some of our Star Wars mm -hmm. icons mm -hmm. well, and uh, yeah. especially one that we've just lost. Yeah. And I know in uh, Celebration Anaheim, um, when she did her, uh, I guess, her stage show, um, she called somebody up and ended up kissing him on stage, which everybody was all like. What, in exchange for a Coke, I think uh, it was? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah, it was like, but everybody was like, oh, did you see her kissing? Like, I don't know. You know what I mean? Just, you know, like. It was great. It was a great classic carry moment, right? Right. Um, well, later, uh, a good friend of the show uh, was with me, and uh, Monty and I were walking around. All of a sudden, we hear somebody yelling, Monty, Monty. And it's that guy that was up on stage. He somehow he somehow knew Monty. And so we ended up going uh, and uh, having dinner and everything together, and he just kind of gave us a little background he it wasn't the first time he had met her apparently he had uh known her a couple from a couple other uh things but uh but yeah yeah it was pretty fun so the next day uh Monty, uh got to get a nice pick um which uh he 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 couldn't pass up the opportunity to get a picture with her and uh mark hamill together and uh she she was completely doing the same thing she was doing to um to courtney she she had him like completely wrapped up and you know it's just the funniest looking picture uh, but but yeah she was just great um yeah you know, always from, gracious with her fans from the, i think he even was had that pixie dust all over him <laughs> yeah she did like to glitter bomb oh uh, she did <laughs> all right well 
in closing, we'll, uh, we'll state this. Uh, in Carrie's one woman stage show that she turned into a book, she may, uh, which I believe was called Wishful Drinking, she made one request for her obituary. She stated that when it came to her death, and I quote Harry here, she says, I tell my younger friends that no matter how I go, I want to report that I drowned in moonlight, strangled by my own bra. So who are we to argue with Her Royal Highness, Carrie Fisher? Hmm. She died at 60, beloved by fans everywhere, cause of death, drowned in moonlight, and strangled by her own bra. Guys, can we talk? During this time of year, you want to show that special lady that you are in balance with the Force, as only a gray Jedi can. But guess what? It's too late for robes. It's too late for anything. The big day was over two weeks ago. You blew it, much like you blew your chance to be in the dark or light side big kid's table. Frankly, I'm not surprised. You probably sat on your couch trying to decide between gray or gray. I'm not saying you're indecisive, but it takes you half an hour to decide what shoe to put on first. I can only imagine Fifty Shades of Grey sent you into a mental tailspin from the title alone. So, way to go. You lived up to everyone's average expectations. Try picking a side next time and see what happens. No wonder nobody lets you pick where to go for lunch. All right. Once again, it's that time. It is time for... Silent Fools! Last week, we mentioned that we hadn't heard from our scoundrels. This week, they made sure we knew they were still out there with their emails. And what do we have up first, Texas? Okay, first off, we've got a lovely little note from Joy O'Connor, who is also known on Twitter as She's a Hot Mess. That's S-H-E-Z-A, Hot Mess. And she writes, Hi, guys. I've been a huge Star Wars fan since I was a little girl. Saw The Empire Strikes Back and saw Return of the Jedi in the theater but was too young to see Star Wars. I really enjoyed Rogue One, and I'm sure you did too. One of the things I liked most about Rogue One was that it didn't center on the Skywalker solo clan, but instead brought a new group of characters into the picture, sprinkled with a few familiar faces to tie the stories together. Additionally, the idea of telling the story behind the story really appealed to me, because I am a detail-oriented person. I really appreciated seeing how the Death Star was developed, who developed it, how the flaw was discovered and created in this case, and how the Rebels received the intelligence about the flaw. Also, I appreciated the fact that Rogue One reminded viewers that not everyone comes from home from a mission, and that this is true in real life as well. Sacrifices are made for the greater good by selfless heroes every day, and that is a hard lesson to grasp. My children did not understand why everyone didn't survive, so Rogue One opened the dialogue to talk to them about who heroes are in real life. I hope more movies similar to Rogue One are in our future. Looking forward to your next podcast, and may the Force be with you. Sincerely, Joy O'Connor. Well, isn't that... That's wonderful. Yeah, I I agree with Joy. Um, These are good opportunities to really discuss some of the harder concepts with your children. I, I was discussing this with a colleague of mine, and she was a little concerned that her boy, who's, I guess, five... Mm -hmm. that would be too much for him and her husband's like star wars you know yeah um so i so i kind of i actually expressed joy's thoughts i said well why don't you look at this as an opportunity for him to you know to discuss this if he has questions but uh, but i can guarantee you you know when i was a kid i wasn't thinking "Hmm, that's a lot of sacrifice i was thinking wow did you see that x-wing you know Right. Yeah. You know, the thing is, is that a movie like this, you have to know your kids and yes, whether or not they're, uh, they're ready for something like this. And I took both my boys to see it. And, uh, um, you know, the ending was very emotional, uh, for them, uh, with the, with the characters all dying because then they got attached. I don't know that they were really looking at the sacrifice element. Uh, but it's something that we, we kind of had an opportunity to discuss here and there. We talked around it a bit. Um, you know, I agree. It was fun to see a Star Wars movie that had someone other than Skywalkers and Solos in it. That being said, I am very excited for the Han Solo movie. Um, I know a lot of people said, well, we didn't ask for this one. We didn't ask for Rogue One either. Yeah. We got it. And it turned out to be a great movie. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I love this email from Joy. And I am really appreciative that she mm-hmm. wrote in. Yeah. Uh, you know, the... I think Rogue One has caught a lot of people by surprise uh, with how good a film it is. And, uh, you know, when we thought we knew it all and what could this movie possibly surprise with? Well, 
turns out quite a bit. Right, right. Yeah. Um, uh, well, we got um, another email here mm-hmm. uh, from our friend Aaron Lay, who mm-hmm. everyone may remember from designing our show logos. Um, this is a very long and well thought out email. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, it is so long that I am going to have to do uh, a bit of abridgment here. So sorry, Aaron, but you know, my apologies in advance. Uh, but we just don't have time to read this entire thing. But I'd like. Uh, but I'm I'm planning on putting the entire thing out because I think it is very thought provoking, and yeah. it does raise some interesting points, like about no. Skywalkers and solos. I think well, that you might have. Yeah, there. Re- so we'll put the yeah. whole thing out there on retrozap.com for so for people to read. So it'll be out there somewhere. Yeah. Uh, anyway, anyways, he says uh, the title of it. Sorry, episode seven. Rogue one is the first real star Wars film in over 30 years. Um, and it starts with first, I need to get something on my chest. I am sick of the Skywalker family. There. I said it. The, the Kennedys know the Kardashians of the galaxy. <laughs> What makes them so damn special? And why do they have to keep showing up? That is why I'm thankful for everyone. All right. Well, let me stop there for a second. I think that is an attention-grabbing introduction. No doubt about that. Uh, I would not compare them to the Kardashians. Um, <laughs> I think they're famous for being famous. Uh, by comparison, in the Star Wars galaxy, the Skywalkers and Solos are so important because they have a direct hand in the outcome of galactic events right uh namely destruction of the death star (laughs) in not one but two cases and the downfall of the sith without them it'd be a very different galaxy but point taken uh they've shown up quite a bit and it's becoming commonplace um so i I think i think it might be meaning like he didn't and he goes into this a little bit but you know the whole if it's like finally we're getting eu in solidified film form and it's other stories, but go ahead, go ahead. Well, yes, but I'm just dealing with the introduction. Right, as it exactly, was exactly. If you need to review this film, then look elsewhere. It said, if you want to know what was wrong with Star Wars that Rogue One corrected, then keep reading. Just know there will be spoilers. So, yes, if you haven't seen Rogue One, turn back now. Um, this is a hot space opinion, by the way. And I love no it. No doubt I about it. I love uh, it. Okay. So Aaron continues, I once considered myself a hardcore fan. I suffered through the great Star Wars drought from the 1983 through 1999. Dark times. uh, Lapping up whatever small crumb Star Wars was released. I tried reading the novels and the Dark Horse comics, but they didn't fulfill the same gratification that I got from the Holy Trilogy. Then the prequels eventually released, and that's when the Star Wars fandom exploded into a rabid cult. I just couldn't take it anymore. There was too much Star Wars, and I had fatigue. Okay, so let's address that real quick. Yeah. Rabbit cult, <laughs> perhaps strong words, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I've always been one of those that yeah, I'll take whatever star, you know, as much stars as I can get. I'm a big oh, fan yeah. of the novels, big fan of the books. Um, I I can appreciate uh, the sentiment that a lot of people have expressed in other areas of the community, which is that sometimes this community can be harsh on you if you don't keep up with everything and you don't even know right. the details of every dark horse comic and you don't know the details of every novel. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, yeah, it could, it can be cultish in a way. Um, but, um, you know, I always, you know, my view is always, you don't have to know everything. Um, just sometimes if you're going to express an opinion about the way something is, uh, if it's, con- if it was contradicted by something that's been established in the continuity, yeah. then, you know, prepare to have your opinion or your version of events challenged. And I think partially too, it's like, you know, space balls, the toilet paper, you know, kind of stuff too. I mean, Star Sorry. Wars was being on everything and right. it was kind of taking away that little, that little nugget of, Ooh, something about Star Wars is coming out that we had during the dark times, you know? Okay. So he continues. Um, this made me question my love of this franchise. And that's when I learned about my complicated relationship with star Wars. I love the universe it created, but more so I loved it for introducing me to the world of film. I celebrated new hope and empire strikes back as important contributions to the art of filmmaking. These two movies lead me, led me to discover Kurosawa and Fritz Lang, which catapulted me into other foreign directors, including Sergio Leone and Jean-Luc Godard. I was introduced to Peter Cushing, where I discovered Hammer Horror, and then fell into the American International Pictures crowd, where I consumed Roger Corman and Vincent Price before moving on to my next cellulite meal. Yet it all came from Star Wars. 
Since Return of the Jedi, we haven't had a real Star Wars movie until Rogue One, and that includes The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens wasn't a film. It was a theme park, a safe, fun, and controlled environment for the cast, crew, and the audience watching. If anything, it was an enjoyable enterprise that was self-aware of its own importance. It just wasn't a movie. Every word and action on screen seemed like it was trying to be Star Wars, but not trying hard to be a film. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to stop there, and at this point, we're going to have to start abridging the email. But right. um Okay, I'm admittedly at a disadvantage that I haven't seen all these films and um, the projects of the filmmakers that he's listed there. Um, I do disagree that The Force Awakens isn't a film and it's just simply a theme park. Uh, I appreciate his opinion. Uh, you know, George Lucas was very unique in his filmmaking. Uh, you know, he set out and he ended up making these movies on his own because of his the problems he ran into with mm -hmm. studios uh, and, you know, preconceived notions about what should and shouldn't be a movie. And he took risks. And in that vein, yeah, The Force Awakens, pr Awakens probably didn't take a whole lot of risks and it didn't break a lot of new ground. Uh, that being said, I still think it was daring in the sense that it killed off an iconic character and it's just telling of its story. And, uh, you know, theme park, uh, that's kind of harsh. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you I, th know, I think I, it's I, more descriptive than attempting to be harsh, you know, like it's, well, sure. But yeah. it can be descriptive and harsh, and at, harsh the at the same time. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think that it's, uh, you know, I think, the force awakens and i remember going into it all excited but i remember telling uh lord girth saber i i think when we're looking back at this we're going we're going to say this was a good reintroduction movie you know um this, but that doesn't make it that doesn't mean it's not a film uh it, i mean right you know i think sometimes the word film is a bit of an elitist label um <laughs> I, I don't know how to further describe that, but um, I think it's a way of elevating some movies above others by using that that tag. Um, but you know, okay. Well, I know, think, I, and I think that I think I could agree to a certain extent with what you were saying. Like, did they did they try to push the envelope on a whole bunch of new things? You know, other than well, you know, killing off Han Solo. Well, right. well, no, they didn't. But if they did. I feel like the reaction would have been visceral, you know, it would have been, right. it, it would have, people would have just been, you know, rabid about it. Okay. Do, do well, I feel let's... like they're going to push the envelope in the next movies? Possibly because now they've reestablished the baseline, you know? Okay. Right. Well, let's move on because this is yeah, going yeah, very yeah, long yeah. here. But uh, some of the other points he makes on is uh, you know, The Force Awakens was more about a franchise building and setups for the next spinoff. You know, he points out that it's not to say it was enjoyable because it was, but he didn't get the same feeling out of that as he did of uh, watching a film from an array of different genres. Right. Uh, at its core, that's what stars represents to him. It's an important milestone in the history of filmmaking, which I think we just touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, but you know, and then he continues, you know what was a movie? Rogue One, a bonafide war picture with real stakes on the line and no guarantee of anybody's fate. Good point. Uh, that's true. I mean, I would say this. It did seem similar to me to you know, movies like um, uh, you know, The Dirty Dozen uh, where, you know, and other, you know, Saving Private Ryan where, you know, you don't have... You know, well, you don't have a guarantee of stakes, but that's not to say this type of right. movie hasn't been done before. Uh, I appreciate Rogue One quite a bit, and I've been fortunate enough to see it four times now. And every time I see this movie, I'm captivated by some new aspect, you know, some Easter egg I didn't see before, some detail on an extra in the background. Uh, and it is an achievement in movie making, um, especially when, you know, my only exposure to Gareth Edwards' work is Godzilla. Yeah. Which was an enjoyable movie i wouldn't necessarily elevate it to that level of film we were just talking right, right. about uh, but uh but i still had a good time watching that um see so, I, I went into this like with i'm expecting everyone to die and if people don't then i'm a little surprised you know like it's a little treat you know um i i think that that's well, uh, I'll let you keep reading. I'll, I'll, I'll let you keep reading his last okay. points. Okay. Well, let's just get to the... I'm skipping ahead now to the last two paragraphs right, here. Right. And again, this was a doozy of an email, and but, I'm but it's uh, sorry, but we've already spent a ton of time on it. And there's that's a so thought-provoking email. It's really yeah. good. It's really worth a read. So I'm going to put this out there. 
you know. If there was a complaint to be found in Rogue One, we it would be the final scene. You know, the one that made us want to revisit A New Hope. It was amazing, it was exciting, but it was fan service. And d- it, those Skywalkers showed up again. Uh, <laughs> upstaging our recently deceased band of rogues were still mourning. The last two minutes of Rogue One felt like a product of a corporation, but the two hours before it were directed by a filmmaker. We should stop using the phrase it felt like Star Wars and instead rally around the concept of creating good works of art filmed at 24 frames per second. Rogue One has made me love Star Wars again. It may not be Goddard's A Bout de Souffle. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but it's still sound. All right. A couple things about that. <sighs> this movie was the prologue to A New Hope, and it leads up, you know, that those everything was leading up directly to the beginning of a new hope. And honestly, I, when I first heard there was a possibility that we're going to see princess Leia at the this movie, I cringed. But then as it got to the movie, I was like, I don't know how you would honestly, I'm not sure how you would end it any other way. Hmm. Uh, if you just saw a ship take off, I, I, when you see princess Leia there, it makes the connection. I think that is the final spike in the transcontinental railroad, so to speak between these two movies. Right. Um, and so I personally, I think it's almost necessary. I think fan service might be better used to describe the R2D2 and C3PO cameo in the movie or the uh, then, Dr. Evison and Ponda Baba kind of thing. Yeah. But that yeah. one was less obvious, but, I, yeah. but yes. Um, so there's that as for the article, it felt like, you know, as for the statement, it felt like star, you know, not using the term, it felt like star Wars and celebrating as a film. Okay. That's fine. Um, but you know, let's face it. A huge chunk of this movie's success is because it is star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and without having a new hope preceding it, I don't know that it has the success it has now. I don't know that this movie ever gets made. Yeah. Uh, like I don't want to, I don't want to have grapes of wrath filmed as a star wars movie mm-hmm. you know what i mean but, there are certain elements of it you know that you i feel like you have to have in order for people to say okay this is a star wars story you know what i mean um right that, that's just my opinion though but um yeah. well okay you know this is this is a phenomenal email from aaron yeah, and i agree with many of his points i take issue with a few others uh, i and i think at the bottom line i can agree that this is a fantastic film uh and that it needs to be celebrated for more than just being a star wars movie but in retrospect i think we also have to keep in mind that a large part of its success is because it is a star wars movie yeah. and that without um, a new hope and without the other star wars films that precede it this one simply is impossible uh it would it would be something completely different uh, without that uh you know we'd need a lot more uh explanation uh and it just wouldn't resonate with us without you know leia and some and tarkin and some of these other characters mm-hmm. um but anyways so there's that so, uh yes. thank you so, so much aaron for that so scoundrels if you've got any counterpoints or anything you'd like to you know go ahead and send us some replies you know mm-hmm. to this and uh like i said i plan on putting the whole thing out there so you'll get the opportunity to read some mo- the minutia in between but yeah yeah great email thank you so much and uh speaking of great email here comes another one i'm honored kind of what to uh well not kind of in the way i am honored to uh, receive an email from steven aka scaldron from roku depot oh, depot <laughs> yeah, i'm not the only one that does it <laughs> oh no uh with the he writes <clears throat> with the addition of rogue one to the star wars saga does it change your recommended viewing order do you now watch episode one through three, then Rogue One, then four through seven, or start with Rogue One, then episodes four and five, then one through three, then seven? It certainly opens up a lot of options. And uh, he says, he continues, one idea I had, or one idea I heard that really sounded appealing is that Rogue One could be viewed as part of a new trilogy, that Revenge of the Sith, Rogue One, and then A New Hope would be the trilogy. Anyways, love the podcast and the humor. Thank you so much. May the Sith be with you and beware Borgullet. Stephen, aka Scaldron, Roku Depot. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, you know what? That's a good. I hadn't really thought much about it. Well, you know, I've you. never had a recommended viewing order. Um, and I think that's simply because I've seen all these movies so many times um, that I just put in whatever I whatever one you're in the mood for. Yeah. You know, if I want, you know, 
if I want the glitz to special effects, I put in the prequel trilogies. If I want the, uh, if I wanted the battle scene, I've thrown in the Empire Strikes Back. Uh, if I wanted a great space action, it's been Return of the Jedi or Revenge of the Sith. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, I, it, for me at this point, I tend to, the biggest surprise in the movies if you don't know anything about Star Wars, I think it's still that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. Mm-hmm. So I mm-hmm. would always, I'd always recommended watching four, five, and six, then one, two, three. Uh, with Rogue One, I think you can do it however you want. I think you know Rogue One, then uh, four, five, six, or you could do one, two, three, Rogue One, four, five, six. Mm-hmm. It, it, he's right. There's lots of options there. But but it's um, weird because they each combination kind of creates a different feel and a different flavor. And you know, do you have like do you have a preferred order? Well, yeah, I actually do know people that have never seen the movies, and so whenever they ask me, I go ahead and recommend. Look, either do the four, five, six, one, two, three thing. I know some people just say omit one altogether, but I think you need no, to I have it that. in there. You need to have it in there. Um, I recommend four, five, then one, two, three, six. Originally. You know, oh, the modified machete order. So yeah, to speak. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. that you see the redemption story. I really like that take on it. This, uh, who was it? Uh, wasn't somebody retrozap? Didn't they say that now a new hope uh, has become four hours long to them? Yeah, I've heard that sentiment out there a couple times. Okay. Uh, I'm actually 1,500 words into an article discussing Revenge of the Sith, A New Hope, and uh, Rogue One. Or, Say Revenge of the Sith, Rogue One, and New Hope as its own trilogy right and, now. And I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to take his recommendation up on there. That yeah. um, when this comes out on uh, the Blu-rays, then I'm going to do Sith, uh, <laughs> Rogue One, and then A New Hope, and just see what yeah. the feel is like. You know. Well, I was up till one thirty in the morning writing this, <laughs> and so hopefully right. I'll have that out for everyone to read next week. But oh, cool. uh, when you stop and you start comparing themes. On some levels it works, sometimes some levels it does not. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I think the biggest tying element between the three is, well, there's a couple. One, the evolution of the Death Star from being framework, you know, not considered at all to framework the end of Ringed Seth to, you know, beginning to demonstrate its power in Rogue One to become fully operational and then being destroyed in A New Hope. Uh, the evolution of Darth Vader across three films. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the eleva- elevation of Tarkin from a background character to a central character to probably, you know, the most important villain mm-hmm. uh, in the three movies. And then there's other things. You can track so many elements across the three. It's, I think, if you were to pick any three movies, I should say Jason movies. This is the darkest trilogy that you could come up with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it does, it does work. But, but, but then uh, a new hope is that much more powerful at the end. Oh, certainly yeah. it is. It, the new hope is, takes on a whole new meaning. Yeah, when you sure watch one right before it, a lot darker. Yeah. Well, again, thanks Stephen. That yeah, was, thanks, uh, Stephen. we appreciate the email. We appreciate, um, you always taking the time to review us on a uh, Roku Depot. Yeah. All right, and then finally, we have uh, an email from an old friend of ours, Darkside MX3, and he says, "My first response is just wow, lots of W's. I love this movie. I enjoyed the characters almost completely. I did not love not having a crawl or the theme song, mm-hmm. but it didn't ruin my experience by any means. I've watched it twice so far, and I've enjoyed trying to find the little Easter eggs, such as the ghost, the mention of Sandula, and possibly Chopper." The later I miss, but uh, Mike Tarkin, our friend Mike McDonald over at the Sandcrawler, mm-hmm. uh, he's there. Uh, it made me feel like a kid again. I mean, if the movie had it, had, maybe I'd been 10 minutes long and they all gave me, all they gave me were Vader scenes, I'd gladly pay. Vader was uh, imposing. I'll substitute a word there. <laughs> Leia brought tears to my eyes. It was a fantastic story in general, just too much to say in an email. And I don't want to steal all the time. I will not be silenced, Taxes. Now, only 11 and a half months until episode eight. I'm going to so, allow that. Well, that's very generous of you. Thank you, Dark Side MX3, for that. I agree. Uh, it's a fantastic movie. Um, you know, I've I've heard this echo, uh, echoed in a few other places, and I'm finding it to be true. The first viewing of these new Star Wars movies is always the toughest because um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't just sit down and enjoy the film. We're always we're all as Star Wars fans. We're you know. Uh, we're looking for all the Easter eggs. We're looking for, you know, how does this fit and how within everything that I know that's come before and, you know, seven previous movies and, you know, how many novels are we up to in the new canon and all the comics and everything else that we know. And, and what was really that in the background? That, what was that in the background? Does this music exactly. have meaning? Yeah. Yeah. It takes that first viewing for it to settle in. And with each subsequent viewing, we get to enjoy it more and more and more. And, yeah. 
uh, I now I'm enjoying taking friends and family to see it and just watching the, re- you know, they haven't seen it and watching the reaction to things that are happening, uh, happening on screen. And I've been very pleased that everyone has enjoyed it as much as they are. Have. Uh, I'm trying to find that excuse so I can see it again. All right. Well, I think that's it for our, uh, extremely long by comparison, uh, silence full segment, not complaining. So, <laughs> yeah, no, that was great, Scoundrels. Yeah, uh, that was a great batch of mail for this episode. Thank you so much. Yeah. For everyone else, we'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, you can mail us about anything we talked about in this episode, anything Star Wars related, and well, hey, anything at all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ask us anything. Perfectly Star Wars related, but uh, open to anything. Ask me about my Fly Retro Zap shirt I'm wearing right now. Indeed. Uh, chances are very good that anything you send to us will be read on the show, so please keep it clean. Uh, and our email address is at sq, I'm sorry, is sqpod at retrozap.com. <laughs> So, wow, what a show, huh? Carrie Fisher sure left a mark. Some scars are below the surface, Dennis. Below the surface. And yet, we'll carry on. Okay, scoundrels, if you'd like to support the show, the best thing you can do is leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We've read all the reviews that we found on the show so far, and yours could be next. Also, we appreciate it anytime you share our show posts on Twitter and Facebook. We love it when you let others know that you're listening. Thanks to our dedicated listeners that have been sharing our show with others. Speaking of social media, Starship Saber and Scoundrels can be followed on Twitter at SQPod and liked on Facebook where uh, where we are at facebook.com slash SQPod. If you want to follow Darth Taxis, he is on Twitter at Darth Taxis. And I can be followed there at DJKVER2. In addition to social media, you can reach us by email at sqpod at richardzap.com. And I apologize for the confusion some of my social media posts created this week <laughs> with regarding that. Uh, what did you think of Rogue One? Excited for Celebration or Episode 8 now? Let us know. The best emails, which is pretty much everything, end up in the Silence Fools. Again, that email address is sqpod at retrozap.com. As always, we are honored to be part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. Please check out RetroZap for other great shows, including Brews and Blasters, The Arg Cast, The Deuce Cast Movie Show, Dune Cast, Skywalking Through Neverland, Talking Apes TV, Techno Retro Dads, The Trade Federation, We Know Nothing, The Animana Cast, Beltway Banthas, and The Sandcrawler. As always, thanks to Aaron Lay for our show logos and uh, that incredible email we got earlier. Uh, James Olpe, the Scott Geek, for our good, the bad, and the ugly show logo. And uh, again, uh, a special thanks to Mindy Reynolds for her continuing to loan us her vocal talents for this and our past couple episodes. And here's our legal disclaimer. Starship Sabres and Scoundrels is not endorsed, affiliated with, or sponsored by Lucasfilm Limited and or Disney. The show is intended for inter- entertainment and informational purposes only. All characters, music, and sounds are the lecture property of the respective copyright holders. All else is the intellectual property of Starship Sabres and Scoundrels, unless otherwise indicated. Wow. So, uh, it's that time. Any final thoughts, Saxus? Yeah, just a little message for the uh, you know, SP1s out there. More not for those who pass on to the four Scoundrels. Rather, use this as a time for perversion. Uh, don't you mean reflection? That too. Right. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Starship Sabres and Scoundrels. As always, thanks for listening and joining us this week as we celebrate the life of Carrie Fisher, everyone. We'll catch up with you next time, and may the Force be with you. Really deep. You came nothing? You're braver than I thought. Nice. Come on. <laughs>